I want to welcome everybody um, to, to the intellectual property at, at the Supreme Court series that we here at American University Washington College of Law have been uh, doing since uh, the, the spring of 2011. Um, anytime the Supreme Court takes an intellectual property case or a technology law case, we invite counsel who, uh, of record who are involved in the case or who represent uh, various amicus curi curiae uh, to come and tell us a little bit about the merits of the case and then to talk about the oral argument that took place during the morning. And so the court heard oral argument this morning in Google uh, versus Oracle uh, to talk about some major copyright issues. Um, and th this is quite a significant case. Um, and I just want to, uh, a couple of preliminary things. I am your moderator. I also signed on to Professor Pam Samuelson's brief, uh, so full disclosure, but I am going to be neutral in my role as moderator. Um, I also want to recognize um, uh, the passing of Justice Ginsburg. Um, we have, you know, been doing, you know, we feel a certain relationship to the court by having done this series for a while and her, her departure from the court is a real loss to the country and to the court. It's also a loss to the copyright community because of Justice Ginsburg's particular interest in copyright and uh, we wish condolences to her and to her family, including her daughter Jane Ginsburg, who's a professor of law at Columbia University and is an expert in copyright and part of the copyright community. Um, but I just want us to, you know, be uh, mindful of, of that change. Um, uh, in addition, um, <laughs> we have a, a terrific panel of, uh, you know, very uh, well accomplished and illustrious speakers. And uh, in the interest of time, we're not going to go through all of their biographies, but um, uh, the a link to a document that tells you about exactly how illustrious and wonderful they all are uh, will be do put in the chat for those who, who would like to follow up on, on that. Um, our plan here is we're going to uh, quick, expo sort of do a quick exposition on the merits of the case, what the arguments were that were presented to the court, and then we're going to ask the panelists to reflect on uh, the oral argument this morning um, that was quite extended, um, not, not as hot a bench as there would have been in person, but there was an opportunity for a, a lot of uh, back and forth and quite an extensive um, <clears throat> back and forth. I also just want a, a, a proud American University recognition of all of our alumni who are involved in this case. So Tom Goldstein, who argued the case for uh, Google is one of our alums. Andrew Kim, who's joining us, uh, who represents Synopsys in, in support of Oracle is joining us. Um, and Stephen Ragland is an attorney at, at Kecker Van Nest who was on the team that uh, was the trial team in this case and was actually nominated as a team to be the California Lawyer of the Year by the California Bar Association. So kudos to all of you. All right, here we go. We are going to be talking about uh, three main issues. Um, whether the declaring code in, in Java is copyrightable. If it is copyrightable, whether Google's use uh, or re-implementation of that code is a fair use and who decides whether it's a fair use? What is the role of the judge and the jury? What is the role of an appellate court reviewing a jury verdict, a general jury verdict, finding fair use? Um, so I'm going to uh, first turn to Josh Block, who's a computer scientist and is one of 83 computer scientists who signed a, a brief to the court arguing that, um, uh, that this is not copyrightable. But Josh, just as an expert, uh, and you were an expert witness for Google in the trial, can you just tell us, uh, that, that just so we have the terminology straight, there's implementing code and declaring code, and there was a lot of back and forth about these things. And can you just enlighten us briefly about what those terms mean um, and how, uh, how the court should look at it in terms of just what, they, what their function is? You're on mute. My bad. Start, start with a bang. Um, yeah, I'll do that. And I should also say um, that I, I've been deeply involved in this case from the beginning. I kind of worked for both companies. I worked for Sun before Oracle America acquired them. Um, and I worked for Google. Um, and now I'm a professor at Carnegie Mellon and truly independent. All right. So 
Java is a desktop computing platform that was released by Sun Microsystems early in 1996, and it quickly became ubiquitous. And um, just to tell you where I fit into all this, I joined Sun in mid-96 to help develop that new platform, and I was responsible for many of the APIs at issues. APIs are application programming interfaces, um, and these lines of declaring code, which we call declarations, um, are direct reflections of the APIs. I'll get into that again in a moment. Um, the APIs allow one piece of software to call another. They essentially dictate the exact procedure for instructing a piece of software to perform an action. So for each action, the API defines the name of the action, the inputs that you have to provide, and the output that you'll get back. Simply put, the API defines what a piece of software must do, but not how it is to be done. It's kind of the, the handshake that enables one piece of software to use another. I heard the words connective tissue and glue in this morning's oral arguments to refer to that. Um, so basically, the API doesn't do any actual work. That's key to understand. It's what's called the implementing code that does the work. The API simply allows the client to call these little pieces of software, which I've called action, and get them to do some work. Um, I stayed at Sun for eight years and then moved on to Google in 2004. And in 2008, Google released Android, uh, which is this, you know, mobile uh, platform. And Android supports Java. And that means it allows programs to be written in Java. As part of supporting Java, Google had to re-implement all of Java's APIs. It had to basically respond to the same commands that Java responds to so that Java programmers could use their existing skills, they could take their existing programs that ran on Oracle's Java and now run them on Google's Android, and it allows them to use all of the tools that they used to use to develop Java programs um, on Oracle's Java and also use the same tools uh, to develop these Android programs. So in essence, Android becomes a part of the broader Java ecosystem. Um, and to re-implement the Java APIs, Google had to include a special line of code for each of these actions, which we call methods, that describes the API, it kind of says what it takes in, says what it gives out, and gives it a name. And it's these special lines of code, which are called declarations, which is what Oracle has accused uh, Google of, of using improperly. Um, at, at the time that it was released, Sun wasn't entirely happy about the situation, but they understood that uh, we software engineers had always been free to re-implement each other's APIs, uh, basically for the past 60 years, as long as there have been APIs. And they also understood that it was ultimately good for Java to be supported by Android. Uh, but Oracle acquired Google in January of 2010, and hardly half a year later, uh, they sued Google in, in federal court. And as you know, we all know, there were many things at issue in that suit, in, including patents. Um, but over the first trial, the remaining issue was whittled down to just these lines of declaring code, which Oracle claims that Google copied. As a software engineer, I will tell you categorically, Google did not copy them because no self-respecting engineer would do that. Uh, Oracle releases a tool that all engineers can use to basically regenerate these declarations when they're re-implementing APIs. Uh, it is such a common function that they release this cool tool and all engineers have it and would have used the tool. It's called Java P. Um, does that basically answer your I think your it question? does. And just there's, there, um, in terms of, it's relevant when we get to the fair use analysis about how much was taken and why. So the, the, basically the structure is, is that there is a, a, a package. So there are 37 packages. That's mm -hmm. the generic, the, the large uh, set. And then there's a class within that set, and then there's a method, right? Or did I mm -hmm. get the pack? Yeah, you got that exactly right. <laughs> so package, class, method, um, yep. and so there's 37 combination, you know, but a total of about what was it, 11,000 plus lines of declaring code. I hear you to be saying that's not really code because it doesn't cause anything. It's not executable code. It doesn't do anything, uh, but it is thought of as code in the court. It is. It is it code. code. It's code. But there's an interesting thing. It is not the same thing as an API. An API is an abstract specification. But in order to implement the same API, in order to respond to the same calls, 
you have to have these lines of code that have to be almost identical to the original lines of code. They're not identical. If you compare them, they differ in small ways, but you know, they have to be very close or they won't work. And that's what Tom was talking about this morning when he said merger, merger, merger. Okay. And we'll get to that in just a minute. Great. Thank you so much. Sure. Um, so we have three panelists named Andrew, so I'll be calling them by first and last name. So Andrew Silverman, um, uh, uh, Oracle did sue uh, Google for this use of the, dec uh, dec the declarations. Um, and as, as the plaintiff, you have the burden to prove that you own a copyright and a copyrighted uh, original work of authorship and that um, and that uh, your rights were infringed. And on that first question of ownership of a original work of authorship, um, I guess I just wanted to ask, uh, sorry, where's, um, if, if we can just um, look at the law for a minute. So uh, copyright subsists in an original work of authorship fixed in any tangible medium. However, it does not uh, apply to any idea or method of operation as well as procedures, process systems, et cetera. So this is 102A and this is 102B. Um, and can, can we hear your argument about why uh, the declaring codes are original works of authorship and why they're not excluded under 102B? Sure, so I actually think it's really pretty straightforward. At least I hope this will be, uh, at least this part should be pretty straightforward. Uh, as you said, uh, code, any sort of work of authorship is protectable if it's original, if it's creative. And here we have a work of authorship uh, in the form of computer code that is conceitedly original. Google has not disputed, back to conceives, that the code that was copied here, the declaring code, was original. And for purposes of the copyrightability analysis, that's really sort of the end of it. You have code. Nobody disputes the computer code is protectable. Congress has protected it since at least 1980. Uh, and the code is conceitedly original. And so just the combination of those two things is really enough for the code to be protected. Google has raised two arguments against protecting the code, those points notwithstanding. The first is to say, as you did, that the code is a method of operation under 102B. Method of operation, all of 102B is the um, codification of the idea expression dichotomy, which says that ideas are not copyrightable, but the expression of an idea is copyrightable. Here, Oracle has protected only its expression of the idea, only its expression of a particular program performing a particular function, only its expression of a particular platform of thousands and thousands of programs that perform thousands of functions. Everyone else in the world is absolutely free to write their own program that performs all of those same functions. So if you want to uh, write a program that creates the larger of two numbers, you can do that. You just can't use the expression that Oracle used in its program, if you want to write a program to verify a, an electronic signature, you can do that. You just can't use the expression that Oracle did when it was writing its own program. And so the idea is whatever that function is. It's the opening of an internet connection. It's the finding the larger of two numbers, verifying a signature. And Oracle doesn't seek to protect that. Anybody can, can, can write programs that do those things. What they can't do is copy Oracle's particular code. What Google's argument is, is that since when you go to invoke that pre-written program, you have to type a particular line of code in order to do it, Google says that that's a method of operation or that, that those two things merge together, the declaration and the call. And we think that's wrong. We think it's wrong because anybody can go out and they can write their own program with their own declaration that describes their program and they can write calls and they can have calls that call on those pre-written programs to perform all the same functions that Oracle does. So that's really sort of the nub of the issue that anybody can go and, and write programs that do all of the same things that Oracle's programs do, they just can't copy Oracle's code in order to do it. 
Okay, great. Thanks. Um, and um, Sai, you are uh, you are a special guest in a way. You are not representing the United States of America in in, in any formal capacity, but we've asked you to play that role uh, because the the U.S. government never per, uh, comments on pending litigation. Uh, but the the government uh, did file a, an amicus brief in in on Oracle's behalf and was able to argue today. And I wonder if you could. Uh, was there anything else in the government's brief on the copyrightability issue other than what Andrew just gave us? Um, yeah, so a couple of additional points. And, and just to be clear, so I was in the government when the government filed its uh, the brief the first time this case went up to the Supreme Court. It called for the views of the Solicitor General just on the copyrightability question. So I was involved in the in the government uh, in the government's formulation of its views in that brief. But I left before the mo more recent. Uh, uh, um, before cert was granted the most recent time. Um, so a couple of things, uh, you know, the government makes the point in its brief, which is that, look, you, you can look at, you can see why someone reading the text of the statute would come to the conclusion that methods, that, that copyright, that, so, lots, that software is not copyrightable because it is, it is in some sense, loose sense, a method of operation, right? You can look at the text and you can say that. The problem, with that reading of the statute is that it proves too much. And I think you saw the, that this line of questioning in the court today, that if you accept that proposition, then it's really hard to draw a line between what we are calling declaring code and what we're calling, what, what we're calling implementing code. And in, in, in some sense, it's all a method of operating the computer. And we know that can't be the rule because that is what, uh, because Congress has made the, the decision to protect software to protect computer programs. And so it must mean something else. It must mean something other than the functionality of the, of, of the code is the reason why it is not protectable. Um, and what the government says is the way you should think about this is in a sense, uh, it, it's, it's sort of at a different level of abstraction that what, what, we, what 102A does is it says, this is what a work of authorship is. It protects, you know, 102A says, copyright protection extends to works of authorship. There's no dispute here that the code, the code edition in this case, the declaring code is a work of authorship. And then what 102B does is says, what not, it does not say what works of authorship are not subject to copyright protection. It says how far does the, and, and, and the, the text of the statute says that, how far does the copyright protection extend? And it says it does not extend to things like ideas and methods of operation and systems. And the way in the, in the government's view, the way the, to read that provision in light of the fact that Congress has made the decision to protect computer programs in this context is to say th that what, what 102B does is it, 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 it excludes from copyright protection the sort of abstract purposes, ideas, goals of the program, the, the, the sort of function of the program at a higher level of generality and says that's what's excluded from copyright protection. So, so on the 102B argument, they say, it does not say that code is not copyrightable. That's not the right way to read it. What it says is it says, you know, the, the idea of having a function that compares two numbers. Copyright protection doesn't extend to that. It doesn't extend to the idea of having software that can check a digital signature. And at some level, the, the, maybe the algorithm by which you do that, it might not protect that either. What it does do is, is it, what it does not do, what 102B does not do is it say, say that this particular expression is not copyrightable. That's not how you read 102B. So that's point one. And on the merger doctrine, the government takes the view that the merger doctrine has to be viewed. It's, it's, it's a, what time frame do you view the merger? Right? Do you view the merger as occurring at the time that the work was first created, or do you view it at the time that somebody wants to use it? And, and what the government says is the right way to think about merger doctrine, because copyrightability is generally viewed at the time of creation, you ask at the time of creation, was there only one way or a limited number of ways of expressing this particular idea? And that viewing it from the other side, from the, the perspective of the, at the time of the user is, is contrary to the general view that the, the general principle that copyrightability is, is judged at the time of creation. Um, and so that's, you know, they say the, the and, and, and what they said in their first brief to the Supreme Court is, you know, to the extent that there are questions about, you know, what a later user 
wants to do, that's not really a merger question. That should be addressed in the, in, under the rubric of fair use. And that's what fair use is for, is to assess at a later point, what is the, wh whether that later use is justifiable in some way. So those are the two, the, the only additional things I would say about the copyrightability point that the government's making. Okay. Great. Um, and Andrew Kim, uh, so you represent Synopsys. Um, so I, if you could tell us for a minute why Synopsys has an interest in, in, in this case, and then uh, uh, what position you took on the copyrightability that is in any way, in addition to what uh, Oracle in the US uh, position is. Sure. So Synopsys is one of the largest software companies in the world. Um, it offers um, software products for electronic design automation, basically designing and testing computer chips. And, you know, Synopsys has um, software that performs, you know, different software that performs various functions and that uses a common uh, command set across um, the different software platforms. Um, I will say that um, while I did represent Synopsys uh, as an amicus in the Supreme Court, um, usual caveats that I don't speak for Synopsys or the firm, um, and these views are my uh, personal uh, views. And I think, you know, what uh, Andrew uh, S. and uh, Sai had uh, per, uh, talked about uh, overlaps with a lot of what we had said. I just wanted to raise two points that I think um, were in our amicus brief that I'd like to focus on. The first is um, there, the second decision, uh, second circuit decision in Altai. Um, there's some discussion about that in the argument this morning um, about you know which elements of a computer program might be protectable um, as expressive, and it you know it. it it announces the um, abstraction filtration test that uh, a lot of folks are now familiar with. And what, what's, you know, the problematic about Altai, I think, is that um, it's premised on the notion that there's only one way to code something, which I don't think is necessarily right. Um, uh, so we, we take the view in our amicus brief that there is creativity and there is expressiveness in, you know, things like declaring code. And so Altai says, well, there might be multiple ways of affecting or bringing about a certain function in a program, but you really only have one efficient choice. Um, so the, what, the problematic aspect of, of that is, you know, what is efficient, first of all? Um, and second, uh, what, um, what, I guess my, my point is, what is efficient and um, who, you know, why do you get to let efficiency decide what constitutes merger for purposes of the merger doctrine? Um, so though that was one aspect of something that we, you know, uh, identified in the amicus brief. The other thing that we want to focus on, you heard it again briefly during the oral argument, um, was, and it's not really legislative history, but we'll, we'll call it legislative history for our purposes, is the Contour Report, um, the report prepared by the National Commission on the New Technological Uses of Copyrighted Works. And, you know, it's a report that Congress had commissioned to try to figure out, well, well do we need additional protections for um, computer programs within the rubric of uh, copyright law. I'm oversimplifying here, but for the sake of time, that's how I'll describe it. And in the Contra report, there is a discussion about, you know, a case that was discussed today, Baker versus Selden, um, and the merger doctrine. Um, and the Contra report takes an interesting view. It says, um, it, it, it takes the view that um, only the expressive parts, you know, uh, of a copyright program should be protected. If there's only one way to express the idea, um, as you know, um, many of the parties argued, or and then the Miki argued, then that's not protectable. But it did recognize that you know, one, there are protectable elements to a computer program, but also it said, um, you know, the part that is protected is the expression adopted by the programmer, um, you know, within the computer program. So does that mean that that you know, is a declaration or a declaring code an expression adopted by the programmer? And the one other thing I'll note about the Contra report is that it says, um, and the, in its discussion about Baker, it says, uh, you can copyright the game rules for a particular game, but the playing of the game itself, you can't copyright. So why is declaring code more like uh, the playing of the game? Um, as uh, uh, the petitioner uh, and folks, the Miki supporting petitioner might view it, um, versus trying to take a piece of the game rules and doing something else with it. Um, so those are the two points I wanted to focus on with respect to our brief. I'm happy to discuss others um, during this open forum.
Okay, great. Excellent. All right. So th that's the case for copyrightability and for non-exclusion through uh, 102B. Michael, uh, Google takes the position, as, as was stated, you have two different arguments, method of operation and merger, um, that would exclude the declaring code. Tell us more. Sure. So first of all, I, I know that all of this is very complicated, especially for people who haven't been working on this case for 10 years. So I apologize up front for that. That's just kind of the way this issue uh, you know, pans out. But the way I like to think about this case is that it's about the conversations that computer programs have with other computer programs. So we don't normally think of computer programs as talking to each other but they do exchange information. So that's what I'm calling these conversations. And as Josh was explaining at the beginning, that's really what these uh, APIs and these declarations are about. And the declarations or software interfaces, as we sometimes call them, they define the templates that are used for these conversations. So for example, a programmer might say java.lang.math.max 4 comma 10. It's a funny thing to say if you're a human being, it's a fairly normal thing to say if you're a Java programmer. And that program that says that is asking the platform it's working with, which might be Java SE or might be Android, it's asking for which is the larger of these two numbers, four and 10. And the declaration that is used to, as the template for that, both defines the question that is asked java.lang.math.max Java 4 comma 10. And it also defines the format of the answer. The answer is gonna be a number, that's what it tells us. And in particular, because 10 is larger than four, the answer will be 10. Now, then there's this whole issue of implementations versus the declarations. Sometimes it's called the implementing code versus the declaring code. So the implementations are the actual instructions that say, okay, if I'm given two numbers, how am I gonna figure out which one of those is bigger than the other? It's a fairly simple task, but even that simple task can be written in Java in a number of different ways. And I'm not just making that up. It actually turns out that the implementation for the max function in Android was different than the implementation for the max function in Java SE. It's one of the simpler methods at issue in the case, yet even there, the implementations were different. The implementations are the instructions to the computer. The declaration, again, it's a little different. The declaration is less about telling the computer what to do and more about the two computer programs talking to each other. The interface between them, that's why they're actually called interfaces. Um, so the, the thing about the Java programming language is that if you want to have a declaration, it's very, very picky about how you write that declaration. In English, if you wanted to say that somebody could ask you a question, java.math.lang, excuse me, java.lang.math.max, you could write that in a whole lot of different ways. Um, you could just have that whole phrase in quotes. You could say, I'm going to start with the word Java, then I'm going to have the word Lang, and so on. You can continue that way. A bunch of different ways you could describe that process. In Java, there is exactly one way that you can describe that. And if you change anything, you change the very question that has to be asked. If you don't say that it's java.lang, if you say that it's packages.math.max, then the, com the computer programmer, when they ask that question, they no longer say java.lang.math.max. They now have to say packages.math.max. So any change in that interface changes the very nature of what people are doing. Um, and just as an example that uh, many actually, of you can actually- I, could, Just in the interest of time, can, so uh, uh, accepting that from the legal perspective, so what? What is it about that this is the only way to say this in Java that so cause, has that legal are, effect? There are two things that are important about that. One, is that the declaration, unlike the implementation, the declaration is the method of operating the computer program. Not the computer, but actually the computer program. The implementation is not the method of operating the computer program. The third-party programmer, when they want to make a call, 
they use this declaration. So that's the first point. That makes it a method of operation and that makes it directly excluded by the plain text of 102B. Alternatively, you could say that the method of operation covers the abstract idea of what the programmer would say and not the literal line. But if you want to say that, then you run into the merger doctrine. And the merger doctrine says that because there is only one way to specify that function, and I am not talking about the function of how to choose the larger of two numbers. I am talking about the function of saying, the way you get that result from this program is to ask a specific question. There is only one way, way to write that line of code, that declaration, because of that merger prevents uh, that line from being protected by copyright. Okay, great. Um, and uh, Pam, if I can talk, you, you've been, uh, this is an issue near and dear to your heart. You've written and been an expert on, on these issues for a long time. So what else, what else do you want to add to Michael's presentation? So the question that I think is uh, difficult for the justices uh, and was difficult in the Lotus v. Borland case and also in um, uh, the Google versus Oracle case uh, is that the justices look at words and they say, words are really um, uh, the kind of thing that copyright protects. Uh, so we have to look at some of the cases that actually have uh, recognized that sometimes uh, words and the selection and arrangement of words and symbols can actually be unprotectable by copyright law. Uh, and the Baker v. Selden case was the first in which the court basically recognized that the selection and arrangement of words uh, for the bookkeeping forms was actually an embodiment of the unprotectable method and system and that they should not be protected by copyright law, that, uh, that uh, useful arts are generally um, uh, embodied in metal or steel, uh, metal or uh, wood or stone, but uh, even when they are embodied in writings, uh, they can be uh, uh, too functional for copyright protection uh, when something is an embodiment of uh, and a constituent element of a, of a method or system, that's when it should be uh, unprotected uh, by copyright law. Now, um, uh, what we have seen in the six uh, other uh, appellate court decisions that have addressed the interface versus implementation issue um, is that all six of the decision, appellate court decisions that have addressed the question of protectability of interfaces have basically said, no, they're not protectable. Altai was the first of, uh, of those decisions, but uh, two of the decisions uh, are Ninth Circuit decisions, Sega versus Accolade and, uh, and also uh, Sony versus Connectix, uh, in which the court basically said that interface uh, procedures that um, uh, that enable uh, compatibility uh, are unprotectable procedures within uh, the meaning of section 102B. So um, uh, those decisions actually, uh, and the, the merger decision uh, in the Lexmark case, the 102B decision also in the First Circuit decision. Uh, and one of the things that, uh, that the Federal Circuit doesn't try to do is to give any meaning to the words of exclusion in section 102B other than abstract idea. An abstract idea is not the only word in that statute. Uh, and uh, it's important also that, uh, that uh, Congress added those terms of exclusion uh, to uh, the copyright statute in order to ensure that com computer program uh, copyrights would not be too broad and would not um, uh, interfere uh, with the ongoing progress of innovation uh, in those uh, in those fields. And I think it's actually worth noting that Sun Microsystems, the developer of the Java language and of the Java API, um, uh, founded the American uh, uh, Committee for Interoperable Systems, and its uh, general deputy general counsel filed an amicus brief in the Lotus v. Moreland case. Based 
basically saying that interfaces that enable uh, compatibility uh, are methods within the meaning of Section 102B. Uh, so the Federal Circuit's decision in this case uh, is the outlier, and the Federal Circuit uh, either ignored or misconstrued every single one of those six additional cases, and it leaves no room whatsoever for, um, uh, for compatibility uh, to have any uh, value. And that's just, I think, a terrible decision as a matter of copyright law and a terrible decision uh, as, uh, uh, as a matter of public policy. And you see all the major players in the software industry are on in support of Google, not in support of Oracle. Great, thank you. Um, and John, you represent a coalition of those uh, tech companies that also makes the argument uh, about uh, non-copyrightability. So what, in addition to what Google and what Pam has just said, uh, does your brief add? Right, so uh, thank you for having me. Um, I represented the Computer and Communications Industry Association and the Internet Association uh, in, in this, uh, actually in amicus briefs all the way up and down the courts in this case. Um, and uh, disclosure, Google is a member of both associations, but did not participate in the drafting of, uh, of the brief. So, so the interest of these associations is all, it's all about interoperability. Whether you want to use the term interoperability, compatibility, whatever, that was uh, our concern. Um, uh, and uh, we, we, we wanted to make sure that whatever the courts came out with did not make, uh, uh, did not interfere with the ability of uh, programs to work with each other um, and for individuals to work with programs. Uh, and so, uh, it, it, again, the, 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 the focus has always been on interoperability. Now, there's been a suggestion throughout the case that this case really wasn't about interoperability because um, uh, uh, Android is not completely interoperable with, uh, with Java, but that's incorrect, that there are even though the program, even though these platforms aren't completely interoperable, there's a degree of interoperability, certainly chunks of code that are written uh, for the Java program, for the Java platform can be ported uh, uh, in, into Android. And certainly uh, all parties concede, uh, well certainly the, the, the US government concedes, unclear to what extent Oracle concedes, that, that uh, a programmer uh, a Java programmer who wants to use a Java program, a Java call, needs to use exactly the same declaration in order to uh, call um, uh, a, a function in Android, so that there is uh, the, this, this absolute uh, matching. And, um, and that leads to turning to the, uh, uh, to the two legal arguments. Um, uh, first, with respect to the method of operation, I mean, there's this question about, well, how do you, uh, uh, you know, how could you distinguish declaring code from uh, implementing code, uh, you know, and, and, you know, if we wanted, is there a way to draw a bright line? And uh, we think there is. Uh, certainly, the, 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 the basically, from, from our point of view, is that any element that is necessary for interoperability, uh, and so clearly the declaring code is necessary for interoperability, between the calls and the uh, and, and, and the subroutines, the pre pre-written subroutines, any necess any method, any element necessary for interoperability is outside the scope of copyright protection. And that doesn't have any sort of bleed over into uh, other areas uh, uh, of, 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 the, of the other kinds of works that copyright covers because this is a unique, uh, aspect of, of computer programs, this aspect of interoperability. And indeed, Justice Sotomayor said that herself. She said, software is sui generis. It is completely different from all the other kinds of works that copyright covers. Um, uh, but if that wasn't good enough, if you didn't want to just draw a bright line and say elements necessary for interoperability are outside the scope of copyright protection, then you do have the merger argument now, uh, and, and, and again, the U.S. government uh, in its brief sort of concedes that there is this, you know, it needs to match exactly. Uh, the, 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 the call has to match with the declaration for, uh, for the subroutine to be uh, called. Um, now, then there's a question, yeah, but the merger, when, 
you know, when do you look at it? Do you look at it at the time of creation or do you look at it at the time that the second, uh, the second comer, the, the, the competitor was coming into the market? But I, I'd submit here, you don't even need to do that because when Java, when, when Sun wrote uh, the Java platform, it wrote the calls as well. As it, it was writing both sides of the interface. You never write one side of the interface. You're doing it all at the same time. You're done, you know, whether you, you know, whatever analogy you want to use, if you want to use the plug and the socket, you don't have to divide, develop a socket and say, oh, okay, now that I've developed the socket, now I'm going to develop a plug. No, you develop it at the same time. You develop both sides at the same time. And that's exactly what happened here. It happened all at the same time. And that's why, again, if you, uh, if you have a call uh, for the call to uh, uh, work in the Java environment, uh, then it needs to have, you need to have exactly that declare, the, the, the exact declaring code. You can't change the declaring code. Otherwise, if you change the declaring code, the call won't work. Now you could conceivably have completely different calls but then you're 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 sort of completely distorting the nature of copyright law and and extending this uh, this uh, this this uh, thickness of protection that, as Pam indicated, is completely uh, 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 a complete departure from all of the other courts. And again, Justice Sotomayor recognized that. She talked about how. You know, how well, we'll, you know what, John, we're going to get to the argument in a minute. I just want to get the, the merits out. Can, can you hold that thought for your next round? Yeah. Cool. Um, okay. And, and I do want to just say, um, we're at this point, we're just trying to get the merits on the table. Um, and then we're going to, uh, we're running out of time. And I, I know we want to talk about the argument. So for the folks who want to talk about fair use, like if we can stay high level about what the basic argument is, and get in, you know, there was a lot of discussion of fair use in the, in the argument. Um, but for the students in the audience, four factor test, purpose and character of use, nature of the copyrighted work. Um, and the first and the fourth factor are what most of the attention was uh, given to. And this word transformative, uh, which has a special meaning in copyright law, meaning have you changed the content or have you changed the context or the purpose or the message? Um, and and uh, there's a sharp dispute between the parties about whether that has happened here, whether taking code from the desktop computer co context to the mobile phone context should count as transformative or not. The nature of the work is important because fact-based works get less protection. The amount and substantiality is measured against the, the copyrighted work, which would be the total, the sum total of Java SE. Um, and then the other thing we look at is the effect on the market. And here there was a lot of uh, sharp dispute about how to define that market. Is it the market of using Java on a mobile phone? Is it the potential to license Java to others uh, to develop mobile phone um, uh, operating systems or, or apps? Um, and those licensing markets have to be plausible, not just hypothetical. Um, and the, the harm is measured in an aggregate. So if one person can do it, uh, others can do it. And it's that harm to the market and this uh, purpose and character of the use that are the, the most important factors in the analysis. Um, and so Andrew Silverman, if I can go back to you in terms of your argument on, on those points, in the briefest way possible, <laughs> give us a quick high, yeah, high let level. Me, let me let me do this really quickly. Uh, so the Supreme Court said in Harper and Rowe, uh, which is one of the four Supreme Court fair use cases prior to today, uh, that fair use has always precluded a superseding use, a commercial copying that takes parts of the original and uses them to compete against the original in the market and to supersede the original in the market. And our argument is that that's exactly what we have here, that Android, obviously commercial, Google makes billions of dollars. They copy parts of our work, they use it in a competing platform, uh, and they have superseded Oracle, not only in markets that Oracle was already in, in the mobile market, but also markets that Oracle was looking to enter, that it was either going to enter into on its own or that it was going to license other people to enter. The Federal Circuit talks about some of the different pieces of evidence that demonstrate that smartphones were a potential market for either 
Java SE itself, which is the work at issue, or for a derivative or adaptation of Java specifically for smartphones. Okay, great. That was nice and brief. Thank you. Um, um, and uh, Bob, you've uh, so the the Motion Picture Association of America uh, wanted to weigh in because, as as Andrew Silverman just said, don't uh, the fair fair use doesn't come up in the Supreme Court that often. And and so, can you briefly tell us about your interest in, or the MPAA's interest in the case and what they most wanted to communicate to the court? Sure. And, you know, the, the motion picture studios and those in the more traditional creative arts are actually on both sides of the issue. There are a lot of, they're defended uh, very often in fair use cases. So uh, they, they have an interest in getting it right. And, and the uh, MPA weighed in on, on two issues. The first factor, uh, nature and character of the use, and then the fourth factor, market harm. Uh, the most important uh, factors, although here the second factor may be lurking. Uh, and on the first factor specifically, um, uh, on behalf of, uh, of Oracle, uh, the MPAA weighed in on the concept of transformative use. Um, Google really argued, I don't know if anyone seriously argued, although heard it today, that a change of, of medium is, is, is fair use. Uh, uh, you know, a DVD uh, uh, development uh, was uh, exploited by the copyright holder. And if someone would come in and say, hey, we're putting VHS tapes on DVD now, that's, that's a fair use, we can do that, uh, that wouldn't have flied. What Google really argued uh, in their brief and today is that the, the, um, their, their use of Oracle software was new, innovative, and socially beneficial. And uh, our brief said that really proves too much. Uh, the traditionally under the first factor, transformative use means uh, a change of meaning or message to the original work. And you don't have that here. And, and, and Google's argument proves too much because if you, you, think about a, you think about a sequel to a motion picture. A sequel to a motion picture is, um, can be, hopefully will be new, uh, innovative, socially beneficial, but it doesn't mean that uh, uh, someone who doesn't have authorization from the copyright holder can come in and make a sequel and say, hey, that's transformative. So that was the argument. Uh, we believe actually there's a Supreme Court case that supports that. Stewart versus uh, Aben hold it, it was not fair use to make a motion picture, an Alfred Hitchcock motion picture, rear window, out of a short story. Uh, that's still good law. And I think by, by many accounts, Personally, I think the movie is way better than the short story, but uh, it still was not authorized. Uh, then we also weighed in on the fourth factor on, on several aspects, but one thing I'll quickly mention is that uh, Google made the argument that um, Oracle only wished to get into the smartphone market, that didn't do it, delayed, it's, it's, uh, and um, uh, we, uh, in our brief, said, you know, that doesn't matter. A copyright holder has the right not to exploit a market. Sometimes the fact of infringement impedes the copyright holder from getting into a, mar a market. That was a Napster case. The record companies really could not get into the uh, online digital download market because Napster was out there. Um, and then we sort of use examples. Sometimes the the, the the derivative of the later work, the uh, exploited work doesn't happen for a while. Just re really quickly, two sequels, uh, uh, The Hustler, uh, young Paul Newman and The Color of Money, older Paul Newman were, uh, uh, were related. Color of Money was a sequel decades apart. And this year, I'm sure it came out because of the pandemic, but uh, Paramount came out with a sequel to Top Gun. So uh, and yet no one would have said in the interim, well, you know, Paramount uh, is not exploiting uh, Top Gun, so we have the right to make an unauthorized sequel. So that was, uh, that was our brief. Okay. Um, and Cy, anything from the U.S. other than uh, Oracle's? I mean, you mostly seem to agree on both the transformative and the, the market harm. Is any nuance in between you? No, I, I don't think there was. I mean, one, one thing that's come up a few times is this idea of, of interoperability. And I, I think the government, in its brief, and, and again, at their argument today, you know, re reinforced the, the sort of point of view that interoperability is a good thing, that that, that is something that can be a, a, a beneficial, socially beneficial use that's justifiable under fair use. And I, I think the key thing to understand 
here is that um, is that the Android platform was made specifically to be incompatible with Java SE. And so, you know, I think the point, the takeaway point there is it, it, a ruling in Oracle's favor on fair use would not mean that you could never re-implement an API. I, I, that's, I don't think that anyone could, could say that. I think there would still be room for fair use uh, in, in the context of true, you know, true interoperability, where you're trying to have, you know, re-implement the API in order to make your new program work with maybe some legacy program. And that's, that's something I know a lot of programmers do, right? They re-implement the API to make, to make it interoperate with the legacy system. I don't think anybody is, is, thinks that a ruling in Oracle's favor would, would mean that, that that kind of use is not fair use. So that, that's just the one additional nuance I wanted to add on to the discussion. Great. Um, and so Michael, you argued both that it's, it's transformative and there's no market harm. Why? Well, you know, in the interest of time, I'm actually going to focus on a slightly different aspect that hasn't been discussed yet, which is that we had a two-week jury trial in 2016 with 29 witnesses that was all about fair use. Infringement had already been addressed in the first trial, prima facie infringement, in 2012, and damages were bifurcated for a later phase that turned out not to be necessary because of the fair use finding. Uh, so, that was the opportunity for Oracle to make its case that this was not uh, a fair use. And Andrew laid out the arguments they made. The point of having a jury was so that the jury could decide that issue. And in the pretrial statement that Oracle submitted before that trial, they identified every aspect of fair use as being an issue for the jury. There was also a section where they were to put down the issues of law that were to be resolved at the trial. And they listed no fair use issues as issues of law. So the whole kit and caboodle was decided by the jury. And we have a system where when a jury decides an issue, if you want to appeal the jury's determination, that determination is entitled to highly deferential review. And what the Federal Circuit did instead was it said that the only thing that it was going to give deferential review to was the so-called historical facts. It ignored the inferences that are drawn from those facts, and it ignored all of the balancing that the jury engaged in. Oracle having concluded, having, having, having stated and conceded that these were issues for the jury to decide, can't now change its story and say, oh no, those are issues for the court to decide. And that issue has come up in, in what's called the standard of review. And that is an issue that came up from several of the justices. On the other issues, uh, you know, we could debate those as well, but I think probably uh, to allow us to get to the actual argument and discuss what happened this morning, maybe we should just save that until that point. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, and the, so Andrew and Pam, I wanna give you a shot, but also <laughs> we wanna get to the argument. Andrew, we, Andrew Bridges, we haven't introduced you yet. So any quick points on the substance of fair use? Uh, sure, I, I think that Tom Goldstein sort of dodged the question directly, but implicitly, I think he was arguing to what I call the fifth factor of fair use, uh, which after Campbell uh, is the Constitution's copyright purpose and whether the uses promote the progress of science and the useful arts. He, he used the words millions and billions a couple of times very effectively. This has spawned millions of programs used by billions of persons. And so I think that's an important fact that he wanted to get across. This has promoted creativity uh, and creative expression uh, and the progress of science and the useful arts. Um, the question of historical facts I find interesting. So when Michael put on the screen a few minutes ago, uh, fair use considerations, um, when I go through the factors, including my fifth factor, I come up with tw about 21 different factual questions that are relevant to an, a determination of fair use that fall within the four factors plus the constitutional purpose. And I think they're all historical facts. Whether something is transformative or not, is a historical fact. Now, a court may not like uh, where a jury has placed the line. I can see review of a jury determination, but to say that some questions are historical facts and that others are not uh, just seems uh, sort of strange here. Um, and I'll just, I'll, I'll sh keep my comments short. I'll just say one more thing. Um, I, I think that uh, the fair use decision here for a court that is struggling with the technology and struggling with the credibility of statements about the implications of a decision. For this court, 
they may feel that the absolutely safest way to decide this case will be on the standard of review on fair use. The jury made a decision, the, the parties willingly sent it to a jury for that decision. Advisory jury by the federal circuit comes out of nowhere and is bizarre. The claim that there's no Seventh Amendment right to a jury would be strange. So I, I think that that's the place uh, to see where where the court may may turn out. I've got more things to say, but I want to stop here because I know we need to move on. All right. Great, thank you. And Pam, any quick? I know there's a lot to say here, but go ahead. Yeah. So I think the um, uh, the issue of deference to the jury uh, is something that. Uh, uh, several of the justices uh, were um, sympathetic to. Um, I think it also makes, uh, it's worth pointing out uh, two things. One is that Judge Alsa, uh, in ruling on the Rule 50 uh, motion uh, that Oracle made at the trial court level, um, identified uh, at least a dozen different uh, fact issues that the jury heard testimony on this and testimony on that, uh, and they must have decided that the the witnesses that Google presented were more persuasive than the ones that uh, that Oracle presented. Uh, and so he went into some detail uh, about those issues, and the Federal Circuit just ignored uh, those uh, things, uh, even though the Federal Circuit had previously said. Um, in its 2014 decision uh, that there was a triable issue of fact on uh, fair use. And I remember that decision actually even saying that tr whether something was transformative was a jury issue. So um, uh, I think that uh, I agree with uh, Andrew Bridges that um, an easy way for the court to uh, dock the technical complexity uh, of the case would be to say, uh, that the Federal Circuit should have given greater deference to the jury verdict. Great. Um, so let's go ahead and sort of take this as our transition into the argument. And Cayman, I know you didn't present your position on the merits of fair use, but uh, on this point, Justice Gorsuch seems uh, quite in attracted to the, the resolution that Pam just mentioned, that the easiest way for us out of this is to remand uh, on the standard of review. Um, and from your perspective, would there be a problem with that? And if so, why? Was that a question to me? Yes. Yes, so um, the, the Copyright Alliance actually didn't take a position on the, the standard of review. Um, but I think it is important to remember the kind of policy interests and the First Amendment concerns um, that have to do with fair use. And if you kind of put those all to a jury, it kind of removes the predictability, it removes the um, policy judgments that Congress is trying to make because you're entrusting the jury to do all of the balancing rather than just finding the facts. Um, and when you, when you leave that to the court, I mean, it, it's too important of an issue um, to, to leave just to the jury. And I, I'd like to make just a point on, on transformativeness while we're here, um, since I didn't get to uh, right. the first part, um, which is, I think, just uh, it, it's important to remember the word transformativeness is nowhere in the statute. It's not in the fair use factors. In fact, the word transform is in only one place in the entire Copyright Act, and it's the definition of derivative works. And derivative works, of course, are an exclusive right of, uh, of the copyright holder to create. And so I think what the Copyright Alliance is, is very concerned with is, is a broad uh, interpretation of the first factor, a broad transformative interpretation, along with a narrow interpretation of the fourth factor, which is uh, the, the market harm, the, the extent to the market that, that you're looking at. Are you looking at just existing markets or potential markets? And uh, it, it creates almost an, an adverse possession-like doctrine if you are saying that, that a competitor can come in 
and uh, you know, take a work in a new medium, but not for a new purpose, um, and call that both transformative under the first factor and that it's not harming the market under the fourth factor because they've entered into a, a, a slightly different market. Okay. Um, so going back to Andrew Silverman, how are you guys feeling about the argument today? What were the, the high points and low points from your perspective? I think we're feeling really good about the argument. You know, there was an interesting exchange. Let me start on copyrightability with uh, Justice Gorsuch and Tom Goldstein about really what, what Google was arguing um, today on copyrightability. And it seemed like Google was walking away a little bit from its method of operation argument, or at least not really pushing that as strongly as the merger argument. So I, I, thought, that, I thought that that exchange was, was telling. Um, on fair use, you know, there were some questions about the merits. There were other questions about the standard of review. Um, I, I thought there were two exchanges uh, that, that were telling to, to me on that. One was a question on the merits of fair use, um, where Justice Alito uh, asked a question that sort of, that within the question assumed that, uh, this was a question to, to Google, that Oracle was way ahead on the first and fourth factors, which are generally considered to be the most important factors. And I thought that that was a really interesting question because it, it both raises the, the merits, but also uh, provides a potential path forward, uh, even for a justice who's thinking about the standard of review and wondering what the standard of review should be to be able to say, look, if, if one party prevails on the first and fourth factors, no reasonable jury could possibly conclude uh, any other way. And so I thought that was pretty telling. And then the, the third exchange was, was right towards the end um, where Justice Gorsuch, who had asked some questions about the standard of review, had heard both Oracle and the government say that Google's approach to the standard of review to make it so that fair use is, is a factual question, that it's, you know, it's on the factual side of a mixed question. And so it's something that would really always need to go to a jury whenever there was a dispute, uh, a genuine dispute uh, on, on any factor. Um, the argument was made by Oracle and the government that that would really undermine summary judgment. And that most fair use cases are decided on summary judgment and this would really be a sea change in how fair use litigation was to proceed. And Justice Gorsuch took those two arguments from the government and from Oracle and turned it around and asked Google about that. And so I thought even for a justice who was really thinking about the standard of review, um, really very concerned about the practical consequences of the position that Google has been pushing. Okay, Michael, how, how are you guys feeling? What, what were your high points and low points? Well, it, it was a, actually a pretty interesting argument, I thought. Um, one of the issues that I thought was kind of curious um, was that market harm actually didn't come up at all. Um, and uh, I'm not, I, frankly, I'm not sure what that means. I mean, you know, you don't always ask the questions that are the most important in the case. You ask the questions that you have the most questions about. That's what oral argument is for. Um, but I did see that there was some uh, um, interesting questions about standard of review, for example. And I thought that Justice Gorsuch, it was no great surprise that this was uh, a topic of conversation for him. He's a great believer in the jury trial. Uh, you know, he actually, as a circuit judge, uh, co-authored a proposal to make a jury demand unnecessary in civil trials to make the default uh, be that you are entitled to a jury trial. So he has always been a strong believer in jury trials. Justice Alito also uh, actually addressed this even before him because he came first in seniority and brought up the fact that you know, mixed questions often are things that are resolved by the jury. And that uh, I think piggybacks on the Supreme Court's prior decision in Hanna Financial about trademark tacking, where they actually talked about the fact that that's really all juries do. Juries always apply the jury instructions and see whether or not the facts that they have determined meet those instructions. So they are always applying law to facts. That's how you get a jury verdict. So I thought the uh, Justice Alito's formulation there was, a, um, was an interesting point. Um, and the other, another point that I thought was interesting was from Justice Kagan. And Justice Kagan, right after Justice Sotomayor had talked about raising questions suggesting that she believed that Google's use was transformative, uh, Justice Kagan said, well, does it even need to be transformative? 
And she suggested that uh, maybe the, that that was the wrong way to frame the question and that on an issue of interoperability, that uh, policy desire to effectuate interoperability should be the basis for fair use rather than trying to ram everything into transformation. And of course, as we just heard, you know, transformation actually is not in the statute. It comes from uh, a law review article actually uh, by uh, Judge Laval. And so it's become a very dominant feature of fair use analysis. But Justice Kagan, I thought her comments were a good reminder to all of us that the doctrine is supposed to be a flexible doctrine and you need to adjust to the facts of each particular case. And because you need to adjust to the facts of each particular case, that's a particularly good reason why we need to defer to the jury. Okay, great. Um, and Andrew Bridges, I know you, you, you did a good job of keeping yourself short. So uh, let me give you an early crack at the argument. And, uh, and one question for all of you um, is, uh, you know, one thing about being remote is we get to hear questions from Justice Thomas that we don't would never hear from before. So I'd, I'd be curious if anybody, you know, he's always been a bit of a wild card to guess because of his non-questioning and argument. Did you get anything out of his questions as well? But Andrew, go ahead. Oh, you're on mute. Thank you. Um, no, I thought the arguments were very effective on both sides. I thought they put forward the, the best arguments they could. I thought they fielded questions very well. Um, I was a little surprised at the emphasis placed on the commerciality of Google's use and um, sort of casting Google in that light, because honestly, there's been lip service given to commerciality. I think Campbell put that to rest quite a bit. Um, I think that most fair use is in fact commercial. Um, I don't know why we assume that most of it is not. I mean, uh, newspapers quoting books and book reviews, they're commercial. Colbert using clips from Fox, from, from O'Reilly, that's commercial. Um, it seems to me that the whole commercial uh, cast, which was as atmospheric as it was uh, technical, I think, um, may have had some effect. But I think that when one goes back and looks at the totality of fair use jurisprudence, uh, that may fall away. I think one of the big questions for the justices here and, and the lawyers were having to grapple with it is, do we need a bright line reliable test or do we have this basket of factors? How do we deal with a basket of factors? Um, and the fact that, and, and I think everybody zeroed in on this, or at least the Google uh, lawyer did, the fact that a general jury verdict was used here, I think is a very, very big point because it's hard for the federal circuit to go and pick it apart because of all the different facts that can come into play. Um, I thought that sort of, tended to go in favor of, of um, uh, Google. I'll just say one of the problems here is that the courts are fond, and courts and Congress, frankly, are fond of creating standards that sound meaningful, that always give courts the right to do whatever they damn well want to do in case comes back to them. And so they can articulate uh, factors for a jury, um, but the, the big fundamental question here is do courts want to ensure that the standards are so malleable that they will just always have the last say. And I think that's sort of what's at issue here. But I think it also ties into the fact that the court is not going to want to wreck one industry or the other uh, in the case. So that's coming back to the case a little bit more than just the argument. Yeah. Uh, but I didn't want to say, I thought both of the counsel uh, did an admirable job on these issues. Yeah, and I will also uh, compliment everyone, a number of justices uh, commented on the quality of the briefing, both from the parties and from the amici, and uh, congratulations to all of you for that hit hot hat tip. I know there was huge amounts of work you all put in. Um, Michael asked if he could have a quick uh, response on the Justice Thomas question, so go ahead. So Justice Thomas, I think it's been a delight to actually hear him speak during these telephonic arguments, uh, and sometimes you've actually gotten a pretty good idea of which way he's going on a case. He asked a lot of open-ended questions that actually uh, didn't uh, show his cards as much as you might think. So it showed what issues he might be thinking about, but less so what his answers were. And what I mean by that is he asked a question to, uh, to Oracle. He said, what would be transformative for code since code 
computer code does whatever computer code does. Uh, so that definitely showed at least that he was thinking about fair use. Uh, he asked about the standard of review, but didn't actually say anything that would suggest what his viewpoint was about what the standard of review should be. He also asked about uh, non-statutory factors, since of course the statute only requires that the statutory factors be considered, but doesn't limit you to that. Um, so I think he's giving a lot of thought to what could have been in the mind of the jury and what effect should that have on review of a, a black box jury verdict? But exactly what he's thinking, we'll have to wait and see. Yeah. Um, so, Sai, let me turn to you. And let me just ask one of the points that was uh, important to, to Google's argument that we haven't discussed yet is the idea that um, there are numerous Java, numerous pr developers out there who've learned the calls and learned how to speak the Java language. And so uh, I think Tom Goldstein ended the argument on sort of this core question of, are we talking about fan clubs or, or prisoners? So on one theory, you're punishing um, uh, Oracle for having uh, created a fan club of developers. Uh, and then Google takes the position that you're actually trying to take them hostage by uh, asserting that they can't use their knowledge in any other context. Um, and can you uh, go ahead, Sai? Uh, yeah, sure. So, you know, I, I, I think that, um, you know, look, I, I, I was a Java developer before I went to law school. I, I learned it in college. Um, you know, I, I familiarized myself with the commands. Um, uh, but, you know, and, and the reason why it was successful and the reason why it was easy for me to learn as a programming language was because the packages in the Java standard library uh, that came packaged with, you know, the, the, the standard development kit were easy to learn. They were, they were organized sensibly. They, you know, there were lots of, lots of tools that they gave you, you know, things like the beans function, which allowed you to do build widgets. So, you know, I think the, the point the government made today was, well, that's, that's, that's just punishing, you know, to the extent that you say, okay, well, there's this huge developer base that, um, that has learned Java, that knows Java, that likes Java, that's just punishing. And if that's the rationale for saying that this is somehow not protected, either under the copyrightability doctrines or under fair use, then that is just punishing Oracle for being successful, for being, uh, for writing a standard library that was well organized, that, that made sense, that had, that was organized in a, in a sensible fashion. Um, and now in terms of like, okay, well, is there a real lock-in problem in this, in this market? Um, it's very unlike the QWERTY keyboard that came up a lot today, right? Where everyone uses the QWERTY keyboard. I, my skills as a Java developer, you know, are sort of useless in the market today because now programming happens in all sorts of new languages that didn't exist when I was a developer, you know, 15 years ago. Uh, so there are lots of new programming languages in, in the industry. Any developer, and I'm sure Josh would agree, has to learn new languages. That happens all the time. And if you look at what happens, at, you know, in Apple, right? Apple used to write their, uh, used to be built on, on C Sharp, a, a, a one programming language. They created a new programming language called Swift. And what happened? Everyone learned a new programming language. That's common in this, in this market. And so I don't think it's quite right to say what has happened here is that every, like all of the, you know, this huge base of developers is held hostage to the Java programming language because people have moved around to different programming languages since then, since, since even I learned. Okay, um, and Pam, you uh, you have a, a couple of views you want to express, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I will leave to uh, Josh Block who knows much more about uh, Java and uh, uh, the interests of the Java community um, uh, in being able to essentially s speak the dialect they already know rather than having to develop a new dialect um, uh, of, of Java. But um, the thing that I wanted to uh, say uh, about the argument was that it was very disheartening to me uh, that um, uh, so few of the justices really had a concept about what an interface was. Um, and so even though I think the 83 computer scientists brief, uh, the IBM brief, the Microsoft brief, and several others um, went into quite a bit of detail about what an interface was and why 
unprotectability of interfaces or at least fair use for interfaces uh, was in uh, uh, was good copyright policy and was also um, uh, beneficial to uh, uh, the uh, overall purposes uh, of copyright law. Uh, but what you saw instead was the grasping uh, for this analogy and this analogy and this analogy and this analogy. Uh, and so um, uh, we have not only QWERTY, but periodic tables, mathematical proofs, um, organizing produce and gro grocery stores, organizing spices uh, in a kitchen, uh, switchboards uh, and the like uh, as the sort of the uh, tipping toward the unprotectability, uh, I think, or thin scope of protection. Um, and um, uh, not very many uh, analogies on the other side. I think uh, uh, Justice Kavanaugh said, well, why isn't this like copying a song? And um, surely he actually knows the difference between those two things. Um, uh, and finally, I'll say that uh, the most heartening thing in the whole argument for me was uh, when Justice uh, Sotomayor basically said, hey, you know, since, uh, since 1992, uh, numerous courts have ruled that program interfaces are unprotectable by copyright law uh, of computer programs. Uh, the industry has kind of grown up with that kind of expectation. Why should we upset that? And that to me is the critical question. And I hope all of the justices uh, will grapple with that as they try to decide what to do with the case. Great, thank you. Um, and Andrew Kim, while we're, since we're sort of focused on copyrightability at this moment, any particular moments in the argument that st stood out for you? Um, I, I think the, the justices uh, uh, were, to the extent that they discussed copyrightability, were, were struggling with the organization aspect. Um, you know, the, the arguments that how you organize um, uh, your universe, as Justice Breyer put it, uh, of different declarations, methods, et cetera, um, it is itself protected expression. Um, you know, obviously there's some degree of creativity as to how you organize something, but I, I think, you know, um, Justice Kagan expressed some reservations about that. Um, and to a lesser extent, um, Justice, uh, or the chief rather, um, and, you know, there's a question that he opened with about the menu and the, in the restaurant. And, you know, I think um, Josh Rosenkrantz had a great response to that, um, which is it's unoriginal, the order in which the appetizer entree and uh, the dessert come out. Um, you know, I, I, I think all in all, I, you know, it's hard to predict where the court is going to go, especially with an issue like this, where you don't necessarily have uh, philosophical valence um, one way or the other. Um, you know, I, I do think the justices will, you know, get to a fair use question, you know, after deciding a, uh, the copyrightability decision um, or issue. But I, you know, it's hard to tell where they're going to come out in terms of um, which aspects of the, the programs are copyrightable. Um, I think there are um, good arguments on both. And I would just like to say, um, I, I think here, <laughs> I feel like in some ways this case has come for the copyright and save for the CIF Pro. Um, you know, there mm -hmm. are, there is a lot of discussion about settled expectations being uprooted, where, at, you know, in terms of innovation, in terms of um, protect, you know, uh, making it worthwhile, you know, sweat of the brow type arguments, which we won't get into feist and all that. Um, and also um, uh, settled expectations as to common practice as to how to resolve these cases. Um, not only are many fair use uh, uh, issues decided at summary judgment, um, as Andrew Silverman pointed out, um, and this has came up in the argument as well, but also there sometimes are decided the motion to dismiss stage too in, in, in certain rare instances. So, you know, if you're going to make fair use go to trial every single time because there might be a, a fact intensive issue or in the majority of cases that drastically alters um, how you deal with copyright more generally. And, and to um, Pam's point, I, I think, you know, the justices are struggling with um, the fact that I think Justice Sotomayor at one point had referred to this as uh, computer programs as being sui generis. And I think that's part of the problem here is that they're trying to, you know, fit this, you know, what Congress clearly intended to cover in terms of copyrightability, you know, computer code and computer programs into general frameworks that have to apply to everything else. And that's, you got some of that with Justice Kavanaugh's questioning about um, the song. So I think those are the things that the court is wrestling with. Um, you know, hard for me to tell uh, 
you know, uh, where the court is going to come out, and I don't want to venture a guess. I think the court will, you know, likely find that uh, there is at least something copyrightable here, um, but where it ends up on fair use and where it ends up on um, uh, deference to the jury, I, I, I don't know. Great. Um, and and uh, John Ben has a quick one, but Josh, you've been asking to get in, and if I can ask you to be brief, but just on this, you know, the court d does care about the impact of its decision, and on the copyrightability question, your brief said this would be very disruptive. And can you just, do you think the court, I mean, problem is that sort of a representation about how the world will change. And they've said, but it changed when the federal circuit made this decision five years ago and the world hasn't ended. How did you, when you heard that, how did you respond in, in your own mind? And do you, what is it you think the court does and doesn't get? I'll answer your entire question, but I got to throw in one other thing first that I've been holding for five minutes, and you know what it is. Um, I'd like to take issue with Cy Davies' claim that Android was made to be incompatible with Java. That is false. Oracle has said it repeatedly, but from a computer science perspective, it's flat out wrong. I was, for a year, part of the team that developed Android, and we worked very, very hard to make sure it would be compatible, and we succeeded. There are billions of lines of code, and I do mean billions, I am not exaggerating, that run unchanged on both Android and Oracle every day. They're not the apps that you and I use, they're the building blocks of those apps, the libraries, and they are the tools that we use to construct those apps. So uh, let there be no doubt, Java and Android are compatible. Uh, Android is far more compatible with Java than all of the mobile platforms that Oracle sold under the name Java. They control the trademark so they can sell Java, ME, Mobile Edition, whatever. But those were violently incompatible. They didn't even implement the language. All right, got that out of my system. Now, I will try to answer your other question rapidly. So first of all, um, you know, they, they said, hey, the world didn't fall apart when you, know, you lost in CAFC in 2018. Well, yeah, but as I understand it from my lawyer friends, that decision uh, basically did not establish a precedent except in like a tiny jurisdiction, right? Because it was the CAFC who, because of some weird copy uh, patent thing in the original case, had, um, you know, taken on this case and done a patent issue and it was in the ninth district. So, you know, we in the industry still assume that we are free to implement each other's APIs and we are still doing it. We've done it for the past 50 years and we haven't stopped yet. If the Supreme Court says, hey, you can't do it anymore, there will be a massive change and it won't be pleasant. Um, and by the way, I'll, I'll, let me just throw in a few examples of what we've done over the past 50 years. So, you know, I'm not just making this stuff up. You know, Fortran was a language invented in 1958 by IBM. Two years later, Univac um, released a compatible Fortran implementation that implemented the same APIs. You know, IBM did the 360 architecture um, in, I don't know, 1964, um, and it had an instruction set, which is an API. And a ton of other companies like Amdahl re-implemented that API so that they could sell compatible computers, you know, and on and on and on. I'm not going to, you know, I'll stop listing them unless you ask me, in which case I'll give you another 20 examples. Okay. But really, it is the way we do our business. We freely re-implement each other's APIs. We do not seek licenses. We do not ask permission. Um, you know, a few times in the past, you know, five decades, companies have kind of moved towards trying to say, oh, you need a license to do it. They have failed. I'm, I'm thinking of, you know, Lotus v. Borland. And at least, at, you know, practicing computer scientists in companies, universities, and open software teams assume that we are free to re-implement each other's APIs. Suppose we couldn't do it anymore. How would things change? I think it would be a sea change. Um, and very briefly, I think it would stifle innovation. I think many of the greatest innovations um, of the past 50 years have happened in the context of new platforms that were backward compatible with old ones. So we could take the people who learned their skills or have programs or whatever uh, that work with those old platforms and we could have them sort of take their skills and their software and their tools along and learn something new, do something new, enjoy it. Um, and you know, so we grew, we, we stood on each other's shoulders, on the shoulders of giants. Um, I think it would increase software prices because of the fact that uh, basically there would be all this friction involved in 
producing software. You, you want to make a piece of software, first talk to your lawyer and see if you can even do this. Um, and often the lawyer will say, nope, sorry, you can't. We don't want to take that risk now. We don't have enough money to defend it in court. It would also favor big companies over small companies because big companies have big legal teams so they could defend themselves in court. It would decrease consumer choice because a large corner of the consumer choice comes from small companies just bashing stuff out to become part of an ecosystem. Java is a huge ecosystem that includes uh, Android and you know a ton of other things, by the way. It includes Kotlin and it includes Scala. Basically, you know, we, and by we, I mean, the broad group of, of computer scientists and developers have been sort of adding to this ecosystem for the past mm, 25 years. And you know, we did that under the assumption that it belonged to all of us. Then when Oracle acquired Java, they said, nope, it belongs to us. All right, almost done. Um, I also think it would decrease interoperability. And I'll say this quickly, but right now we develop things to work with other things. Whereas um, if all of a sudden we couldn't re-implement each other's APIs, we would develop things to work with our own things and you'd get silos that only work within the silos. Things would not work across the silos and you know, the devices we got um, would become less functional. Final point that when I said things would become more expensive, um, I think that it's not just software because these days everything is software. If you buy you know, a mixer or a toaster or a car, it's 80% software. So if software gets more expensive, everything gets more expensive. Okay. Um, so one thing that uh, I noticed and a few of the panelists have put in the chat is uh, among the things the justices did not spend a lot of time asking questions about were the substantive fair use uh, questions. And I know some of the Amici, including uh, Bob and Cayman, you, you know, part of your reason for participating was to try to draw attention to the way the lower courts are, are uh, treating the four factors and transformative use and you didn't get a lot of traction. And Bob, can I ask you first to, why do you think that is? What, wh why was there not as much engagement as you were hoping for? And you're on mute. Sorry, uh, actually, I, I, uh, I looked at the transcript and the, the word Campbell, uh, Campbell Lake of Rose, the watershed case came up twice, uh, both uttered by, by uh, Josh Rosencrantz. Nobody on the court uh, uh, cited it. I actually think it's an indication that the court believes that this is not fair use. And if they could look at this de novo, they, they would, at least most of the, uh, the justices, I mean, Justice Gorsuch's comment, interesting, Justice Thomas asked about, uh, 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 asked, I think, Tom Goldstein to give him an example of, of uh, what would be transformative in the software context. I'm sorry, he asked Josh Rosencrantz, and Josh talked about reverse engineering. Um, another indication, I think, that uh, most of the justices believe that if they were viewing this to know would be fair use. I know that they're less clear about the standard of review issue, but I, uh, I, I have, and again, this is, I'm sure I'll generate disagreement. I have the sense that they think that, that if they were deciding this de novo, they would find that clearly this was not fair use and didn't feel, feel the need to ask about it. Okay. Um, and John Band, you had asked to, to make a quick point. Sure, and, and this actually ties a little bit to what uh, Bob was just saying. So what I found very interesting was, uh, you know, the, when they, they, they complimented the briefs of the Amici, but they only referred to briefs uh, supporting Google, meaning they, support, they referred to the 83 computer scientists, they referred to Microsoft, they, they talked to other industry briefs, software industry briefs, which I will take to mean my brief, but I don't know that for a fact, but I, I prefer to they would have said it. But again, they, and this is where I'll actually disagree a little bit with Pam. I was actually, and I almost never do, but I was actually heartened by the fact that the, the, they didn't fall for sort of um, Oracle smokescreen throughout this case, talking about Harry Potter or talking about all software. They really focused on the declarations and they seemed to understand that this was about declarations about these, you know, what, what, what Tom Goldstein referred to as the connective tissue. And so, um, uh, you know, so I was actually heartened by that and that they, that they really focused on that. And, and so I would actually disagree with Bob. I think the fact that they didn't really get into the, 
substance of fair use could be for exactly the opposite reason, because it was pretty obvious to them that this might be a fair use, but then they had to, you know, question what, you know, what is the appropriate role for them to play uh, with such a, you know, a case where it's so obviously, you know, um, uh, you, know you have the jury that made a decision, but then you have the, the federal circuit that reversed it, and how do they sort of get themselves out of this mess? Great, thanks. Um, so I, I want to first uh, thank everyone for their patience. I want to give Cayman the, a, a word here and let the audience know we are going to have a reception um, on, on Zoom. We're going to put the link in the chat and we invite you to join us. It's open to everyone uh, and we're going to find a way to organize you into co realistic conversation circles uh, using the technology as best we can. So for those of you who didn't get your question answered or and, and uh, I'm delighted that Michelle Schacht is with us and big fan of Anchored down in Anchorage. And uh, that's, that's a real treat. Uh, so thank you for being with us. Um, so Tanya has just put the link in there. We'll be joining you there in a little bit, but came and take us away. Any last uh, sort of observations about the, the, the way the court's looking at this case and, and sort of bright lines versus multi-factor, maybe we punt and do this on standard of review. What's it looking like to you? Yeah, I think just the one overall thought I had, and you know, the court is often concerned with um, you know what will happen with the ruling, but they seem especially concerned today. I think both sides have, have kind of made the sky is falling arguments, for for lack of a better term. That that you know, on Google's side, it's it's you know, all sorts of, of software will be compromised and that, it, you know, you won't have interoperability. Um, Oracle is saying there's, uh, you know, all sorts of copyrighted works that won't be created because of this. Um, and that's really often where the court looks to the SG's office. I, I think you notice that almost every question the justice has had uh, for the Solicitor General was, you know, what is your view of how our decision uh, will affect copyright law and software in the US. And so I, I think that's a, a really important thing to watch and, and maybe the deciding factor, which way the, the government came down on the side of. Great, thanks so much for that. Um, and I wanna apologize again for the technical difficulty we had at the top. There were a few questions, uh, most of which got answered and those that didn't, I, I apologize for that. Um, but someone is saying the link to the Zoom isn't working. So maybe let's just take a minute uh, and make sure that that works um, to the reception. Um, but can we, uh, I know that the, pa I, the attendees cannot um, be seen, but I will uh, give my a word of thanks to everybody. Thank you for your participation. Thanks for uh, the discussion uh, and thanks for your patience. And Tanya, while you, uh, sorry, we're obviously having link, link issues. While she does that, is anyone willing to hazard a guess on the outcome? Anyone willing to count noses? Well, uh, let me just, I, I, I saw, you know, three very solid votes for Google with uh, Breyer, Sotomayor, and Kagan. And then I thought, you know, after that, it's more of a crapshoot. I mean, certainly one could interpret various statements that, uh, you know, questions that Kavanaugh and uh, Gorsuch and Roberts made as, as you know, could be uh, favoring uh, Google, but it's harder to tell. And then, you know, I'd say Alito, highly unlikely to support Google, much more likely to support um, uh, uh, Oracle, and then uh, Thomas, unclear. I, I was interested, I mean, Justice Thomas is a, is a textualist, and if, if you think about um, the way he dealt with uh, sort of 
the um, useful articles and just sort of said, well, the test is what the statute says it is. Um, and he did draw attention to 102B. I wondered, I mean, I agree it was open-ended. I didn't see him leading in a particular direction, but he seemed to be attracted to possibly hooking something into that language and what I couldn't quite tell. I don't know if anyone has any theories on that. I, I think he might not uh, have a firm position on that. I mean, I found it very interesting that when we had a second round of questions for Tom Goldstein, which to my knowledge is the first time in these telephonic arguments that there's been a second substantive round after the uh, respondent has Ray taken a seat. Um, they, uh, uh, when that question came up, t time came up just as Thomas passed. He was uh, one of two or maybe three justices that passed on that round, um, which I thought was really interesting. He didn't try to hone in on some additional issue. Uh, he again kept his cards close to the best. Great. Uh, this is Andrew. I, I don't want to engage in a, a, a nose count more than to say, obviously, I think Oracle is going to prevail. Um, but what I, I did want to say, and this goes to, to what Michael just said, you know, I, I was heartened by the fact that the justices were, were really engaged, that there was an hour and a half's worth of argument. They were really focused on this. Uh, they gave it a ton of attention. They obviously had really prepared for it. And I, I thought it was great. I hope that a lot of people um, who don't normally follow the court that much were paying attention because I thought it was actually, I thought it was great. I thought the advocates were great. The justices were happy with the briefs. I, I thought it was a really, I thought it was really fun. I thought it was really interesting. I, th I thought it was really, really wonderful. Anyone else? Pam, well, uh, you... oh, go sorry, to no, go ahead. sort of end where we started with, I, I think it would have been nice to have Justice Ginsburg on the bench and to see where you know, her views through the questioning. Um, I think that was a tremendous loss for the court. And, uh, you know, it, particularly, if, again, like, for a case like this, where you don't split on ideological lines and, you know, it could go, uh, you know, uh, any any which way, I, I think having her voice and having her views would have been very helpful in this case, especially for the nose counting. Um, but I will decline to actually count noses here uh, as I did before. <laughs> Pam, any, are you willing to hazard a guess? Hello? Hi. Hi. Pam, Sorry, where, you're on mute. Is. Pam, you're muted and somebody else is unmuted. Okay. Um, so, Still in the seminar and conference. Uh, so, um, like uh, John Band, I thought the questioning from uh, Breyer, uh, Kagan, and Sotomayor uh, were receptive to the the copyrightability issue and the kinds of uh, metaphors that they were drawing upon were the kinds of metaphors uh, that would suggest that maybe um, this stuff is unprotectable. Um, uh, I think um, uh, the jury issue w is much more attractive to others of the justices. I think, you know, regardless of whether Justice uh, um, uh, Ginsburg was on the court or not, um, Google has to get five votes because um, uh, otherwise it's basically an affirmance of the federal circuit. Um, and I think that's not what the software industry needs. Uh, so I think that the court will, uh, will try to reach some resolution and will be trying to pay attention to the impact of its decision, not just for these two litigants, but for um, the software industry more generally. And I think if they, they read those uh, briefs again um, uh, from the industry players, I think that uh, on the whole, they uh, support Google more than they support uh, uh, Oracle in this case. And um, we now have a, a question in the, in the Q&A from Chad Rutkowski about the future of SSO and whether the questions about the QWERTY keyboard uh, put the idea of copyright in structure, sequence, and organization at risk or not. Um, and I don't know if anyone has thoughts on that question. Yeah, I can, I can 
uh, yeah, I thought that was an interesting line of questions about, you know, this, the, I think it was from Justice Kagan about the honing in on the sequence in organization with her um, analogy to the, to the grocery store. Um, and, you know, I think, I think it, it was, she was expressing some skepticism about whether, um, you know, copyright protection, even in, in literal code, extends so far as to the structure of the organization. And it's unclear to me what, you know, how many votes there are for that proposition, um, given the fact that, you know, the idea of non-literal copying is well established in, you know, every other area of copyright law. Um, but but I do think that there was you know at least from her some skepticism of that of that idea that of that that copyright protection in software in particular would extend to the organization of the packages in a software package. So I I want to actually uh, weigh in just uh, briefly on the SSO issue. Uh, one of the things that we said in in our brief that um, I would hope that the court would. Uh, acknowledge at some point um, is that SSO is just proves too much. Uh, as the Second Circuit said in the Altai decision, um, the idea that some non-literal elements of programs can be protected by copyright law is something that they could agree to, but the, the terminology, structure, sequence, and organization um, uh, would include uh, many things that are unprotectable even by patent law. Uh, so, um, uh, uh, one of the things that I, I have been worried about with this kind of broad SSO stuff uh, is that in the era in which we are now, in which um, many, uh, um, many structures for uh, programs after Alice uh, versus CLS Bank are unprotectable by patent law because they are too abstract, um, all you have to do is call them SSO in copyright land and all of a sudden they seem to be protectable. So the, uh, you know, in an ideal uh, Supreme Court opinion in this particular case, uh, they would say SSO is not useful. Um, you have to be more precise. Um, and uh, we want to make sure that copyright protection is not being used to give patent-like protection uh, to elements of programs, given that there are both patents on uh, processes and methods that are embodied in programs, uh, and also some types of um, uh, elements of uh, software that are SSO, such as uh, uh, the algorithms uh, that um, the court dealt with in the Benson case, um, are just plain unprotectable. So uh, it seems to me that that's actually something uh, which um, I would want the court to say. Um, and uh, I think if they were thinking this through carefully that they would say that? I think it's going to be really hard for the court to, to walk away from, uh, call it SSO if you want, call it selection and arrangement if you want. That's the language that the Supreme Court used in Feist and it couldn't have been clearer in Feist that the protection of the selection and arrangement of even un uncopyrightable things is protectable. And unless they're going to draw a, a sui generis line just for software uh, that's different than the line for all other literary works, I think it would be incredibly difficult, bordering on impossible, um, to get rid of copyright protection for their sequence and organization and software and yet somehow still keep uh, protection of selection and arrangement in other, liter other literary works. The selection and arrangement of headings and columns in Baker v. Selden was not protectable, um, despite the fact that it was creative. Um, so um, uh, the court's own precedent recognizes that sometimes the selection and arrangement of words is uh, unprotectable. Um, there are a number of other cases that have followed that route, uh, but um, uh, I'm not going to go there anymore. So. Uh. <laughs> yeah. um. All right, so if you look in the chat, I've, I just went into my Zoom account and created a meeting um, so we can, uh, and it, I just got a notice that somebody's there in the, in the waiting room. So I think our idea of being able to have a green room with, we still have 82 attendees listening to us. I'm gonna stop, I'm gonna stop.